I want to work on it. In fact, uh, I'll talk to you more about that, Richie, because uh, okay. one of them is going to be real handy. Uh, yeah. One of those. Yeah, so. this is this is probably the, this is the first piece of rail equipment saved from the Hoboken manufacturer slash Hoboken show, and will probably be the only piece, um, which is really exciting. Um, well, actually, I'm not aware of anything else exists from it. <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> But um, and we've had good luck with the good results with the preserving equipment. Every piece of equipment we preserved came with a little a little posse of people that wanted to support it. And uh, and this engine is doing just that. So uh, congratulations on everybody. This is going to be a great piece. And I'm thrilled that it was the next generation put that whole thing, whole thing together. You know, so um, great job, Richie. Uh, let's see, big picture news. Um, a lot has happened in, in the big picture of, of railroading. Uh, I don't know how many people remember in the, in the, around in the 1980s where Burlington Northern was going to abandon the Northern Pacific line across Montana, and then uh, Dennis Washington bought it and became Montana Rail Link. Well, just this week it was announced that Burlington Northern wants that piece of railroad back. They've gotten so busy that... Uh, uh, what I'm sure what they'll do is they'll, they'll they'll single direction everything and run one direction on the Great Northern, the other one back on the Northern Pacific. So uh, Montana Rail Link is being sold back to Burlington Northern Santa Fe. So that's uh, that's interesting. Uh, Montana Rail Link made a big made made a really developed that line pretty well in the, in the years it had it. But um, and then in other big news, uh, CSX and Amtrak made a deal to help the whole takeover of Pan Am railways up in New England. So CSX wants to dominate New England and wants to take over Pan Am railways. And part of that was getting uh, support from Amtrak to do it. So they're actually introducing a new train up there. Um, oh, geez, I forget the name, what the name of the train's gonna be, but uh, so that's that's a big step. So the CSX takeover of Pan Am uh, sounds like it, that may happen. And of course, uh, Kansas City Southern and Canadian Pacific, that one is going real well too. So that merger may happen. So the, 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 the national rail map is gonna change big time. And um, locally, um, the, uh, the sharp blue uh, dual mode locomotive that NJ Transit painted for the Army Navy game, or they, they wrapped it in a big decal for the Army Navy game. That thing's been touring all over the system. And for the first time yesterday, it was running on the uh, Mars and Essex line. So those of us out here uh, got to see it firsthand in the bright blue, under bright, bright blue sky. So it's making the rounds. Uh, if you get a chance to see it, take a look at it. It's a sharp looking engine. So uh, just let me know when you're ready, Rich. I can... Yeah, we're all set, Mike. Um, so uh, Pierre, um, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna turn over to Pierre Lacombe. Uh, who's put together a presentation for us on the uh, construction of the Camden and Amboy Railroad, uh, New Jersey's pioneer railroad. Um, so Pierre, the, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Richie. I do appreciate this opportunity to talk to your group. Um, I prepared this on the Camden and Amboy Railroad and the, the function of the talk is how is it constructed and what remains in the year 2022? Um, so I'm doing this for the Tri-State Railroad Historical Society, which is a member of the National Railroad Historical Society. And I'm a member down here in, uh, in the Burlington County area. The objective of the presentation is how is the Camden and Amboy Railroad constructed? The land surveys that went on there, the route decisions, roadbed preparation, ballast that was used, stone sleepers, the bridges and trestles, and the features that remain today, the stone sleepers to support, the Stevens T rails, wood rails, stone rails, the bridges, culverts, and trestles that remain, the wharfs that remain, and the spikes, rails, and plates. My, my main focus will be on the stone sleepers um, with minor amount on uh, the other features. So how did I get started in this type of an investigation? Most of you are more interested in steam engines and well, I'm a geologist and so the, uh, my, my world is around that. But in 2012, I, I attended a Camden and Amboy Railroad presentations in Bordentown, New Jersey. And there was 
three very, very good speakers. They made many, many good solid facts. And, but there was one questionable geologic statement and all three of them made the same statement. All stone sleepers were from Sing Sing prison. And I knew that was wrong. There's stone sleepers that are in Bordentown. Some of them are this red sandstone, some of this black and white nice, and a few of them are this white marble. In Sing Sing, they only quarried white marble. So these other ones, these come from around the Trenton area and these come from Bucks County. So I just, when I talked with uh, John Kilbride, who was, he clearly was the better speaker of the group and I apologize to the other two men, but John had a wonderful delivery and full of facts and information. And so I went up to him and I said, why do you say everything's from Sing Sing? And he says, that's what all the literature says. And he's right, all the literature says that it comes from Sing Sing. So I started walking across the state of New Jersey, looking at the, the um, stone sleepers. So stone sleepers were used along this red line across the waste of New Jersey. Sing Sing Prison is located here at the north end of the Tappan Zee. And if they filled the boat there, there was no way to bring it to Bordentown unless you went down to New York City, down to Cape May, up Delaware Bay, up the Delaware River to Bordentown. That's a 300 mile boat ride. That's a phenomenal boat ride. They couldn't, they couldn't bring it across on the, the railroad because the railroad didn't exist. And the stones that are here are all come from this area. So it just it didn't make any economic sense to move 300 miles. And the sleepers in Burlington County, this section right here, they're, they're not marble. They're mostly sandstone and gneiss that was quarried in Mercer and Bucks County. In Mercer County, most of them are nice sandstone and conglomerates, mostly quarried in this area. And a few of them are quarried in this area of the state. In Middlesex County, they're mostly gneisses and marbles that come from this area. And so in all the stone abutments, well, there's, they have all been replaced up here, but the ones that are down here are again, rocks from this area. So the Camden Amboy Railroad generally used stones from within 20 miles of the right of way. They didn't move them 300 miles. Thank you. Josh, yes? Um, are you, did you, are you supposed to be sharing your slide deck? Yeah, I'm sharing it right now. Uh, we don't see anything. Oh, you don't? Okay. I've got it. Let me see if I can do something here. Now, can you see it? Uh, no. Hmm. What would I do to make it change? Um, so you just have to hit that green button, um, share screen. I hit that. And then hit the upper left button. Uh, I don't see the green button. Uh, it should be on the bottom. All the buttons. Let's see. Let me see. I've got about nine screens up here. Let me see. Okay, I hit that share screen. Yep. And then um, select the screen that your show is on. Should be the upper left one or there about. Screen two. Yep. So select that in blue and then hit the share button on the bottom right. Okay, now do you see it? Uh, give it one second. Yep, now we see it. Okay, I apologize for that. Not a problem. So here we are. Uh, this is slide one again, the Camden Railroad, how it was constructed and what remains in 2022. And I'm doing this for the Tri-State Railroad. The object of this presentation is to 
how the Camden Nambour was constructed, the land surveys, the route decisions, the roadbed preparation, the ballast, the stone sleepers, bridges and trestles, and the features that remain today. My main feature is the stone sleepers that supported the Stevens type T rail, but they also, I found stone sleepers that st support wood rails, stone rails. There's bridges and culverts and trestles made out of local stone wharfs. And there's, I've also found spikes, rails, and plates. I'll talk about these lower three very, very minimally. Oh, I got started in this investigation. I already went over that. And I don't think I need to do it again. But I was listening to, to John Kilbride and others give an excellent presentation. And they said all the stone sleepers came from Sing Sing. I went up to John afterwards. I said, why do you say that? And he said, because that's what all the literature says. Well, this is marble from Sing Sing Prison on the right-hand side. But most of the stones in Bordentown are this red sandstone and this salt and pepper gneiss. And as a result, um, this, this material certainly didn't come from Sing Sing Prison. Sing Sing Prison is up here on the Hudson River um, just north of the, it's the north end of uh, the Tappan Zee. And um, for them to, the prisoners to have loaded on a ship, drive it all the way down to New York City, down to Cape May, up Delaware Bay, up to Philadelphia, then to Bordentown, that's 300 miles. They didn't do that. That's just, just too expensive to move that. And they couldn't drive it to here and then bring it across because the railroad didn't exist. They couldn't bring it across on the Morris Canal because that wasn't completed at this time and then bring it down the Delaware. So it just didn't make any sense. So the real truth in Burlington County, this area of it, all the stones came from Bucks County and Mercer County. And Mercer County, all the stones came from Mercer County and Bucks County. And in Middlesex County, all the stones came from the lower Hudson River. The stone abutments, there's not many stone abutments in, in Middlesex County that remain, but the stone abutments that exist in Burlington and Mercer County, all of those stones come from this area. So the Camden and Amboy, they didn't ship use stones from all over from Sing Sing Prison. They generally got them within 20 miles of where they were. If you go to New York City, you can see the Washington Arch, Arch in Greenwich Village, you're gonna see the inward marble. This is the marble that they quarried from Sing Sing Prison. There's a number of quarries. This isn't Sing Sing, but it's the inward marble, which is a geologic name for it. The brownstones in New York City and all of the churches in Trenton and Bordentown, they're all made out of Stockton sandstone, which is just a little bit north of Bordentown. If you go to Fordham University, they're using a Hudson Valley nice to build their buildings. Or if you go to the Delaware Valley, most of the homes and palatial buildings, they're made out of a Delaware Valley nice, not a Hudson Valley nice. And then some of the churches, the older ones and the foundations, they're made out of a coastal plain conglomerate. So these are the major types of rocks that they use. They use probably 10 other types of rock but these are the major ones. This is a geologic map. This is Trenton right here. This is the Delaware River. I'm hoping that you guys can see my, um, my icon that shows the outline of the Delaware River. And the Camden and Amboy were from Bordentown to Yardville to Robbinsville, Windsor to Heightstown. And so the geology of this area the falls of the Delaware are right here. These are all hard rocks right here. So these gneisses and the gneisses that are within the Wissahickon Formation, this sandstone, the Stockton sandstone, the red one, and then there's conglomerates, the coastal plain conglomerates out and these forming these mountaintops, Mount Holly, Cherry Hill, the Arnie's Mount, all of those mountains are topped by conglomerate. They were used in, in Heightstown. So this gave me a, a kind of an idea of what I was looking at. 
So the quarries, here are the quarries that are in this area. And there's, there's many, many old quarries that they could have gotten the stone from. They certainly didn't get it from um, Sing Sing Prison. If you, so now they have to do a survey. So now my idea is, okay, I understand a little bit about the stones, but when they wanted to survey from South Amboy to Bordentown, it was a pretty straight line. They just wanted to, they wanted to have steamboats come up from Philadelphia to Bordentown, put people on the train and go across. State legislature wouldn't allow them to do that. They wanted them to build all the way to Philadelphia, to Camden, really. And in the 19, or 1830s, there was only Middlesex County and Burlington County. There was no Mercer County. So it was just a simple matter of going through Middlesex, going through Bur Burlington into Bordentown. That was a simple survey, 31 miles. It just followed the stage stagecoach route. It was fairly flat. However, when you wanna go from Camden to Bordentown, they already had a steamship going up the Delaware River and then they could get on the, on the, the um, stagecoaches and just drink, bring them up to there. But in the 1830s, there was no Camden County. This is Gloucester County. This is Burlington County. There is no, no Camden County per se. And they didn't want to replicate going up the Delaware River. They wanted to get new customers because they already had a boat going up the Delaware River building a railroad track next to the Delaware River was economically foolish. So they decided to do this red route. So they surveyed this whole red route going through Morristown, a little north of Mount Holly, into Jacksonville, they call it Slabtown then, into Columbus, they called it Black Horse then, and then come up to the Crosswicks Creek to meet what was going up to uh, South Amboy but they would have to have a spur to go to Bordentown to pick up the people that wanted to travel on boats up the Delaware River. But this had, there was a, they didn't have topographic maps at that time. So they didn't know how much terrain they would have to do. This red road had an awful lot of terrain on it. So they'd have to do an awful lot of cuts and an awful lot of um, uh, causeways. So they decided to have a second route, a little more inland, thinking that it would be less uh, terrain to go up and down. So they went through Morristown, Mount Holly, into Juliustown, into Georgetown, then up to the Crosswicks Creek. Again, they would have to have a spur that would go to Bordentown to pick up people off the boat. This was just as tortuous a route, just as much topography. They realized this was a very inexpensive route right here. It was flat. They didn't have to, all they had to do was put bridges in. Bridges were easy to build. And so they chose the yellow route just because that was the easy route, abandoning these two other plans because their, their ideas had fallen apart. However, when they got to Bordentown, they surveyed this part, this part coming from Camden. They had surveyed this part coming from South Amboy, but there is a massive hill right along the Delaware River, and this is Crosswicks Creek. And this massive hill had to be gone up. They had to go up it. And the best route for them was to follow along this edge of the hill and then come up Thornton Creek, this little creek right here. It would have been a natural incline for them. And then they could just go right across and, and match up. Unfortunately for them, there was a rather important man that lived in this house right here. So they tried to or argue with him and they chose a second route. He did not want that route either. So they chose a third route. He did not want that route either. He didn't want the yellow one. He didn't want the orange one and he didn't want the red one. This man was Joseph Bonaparte. He owned 1,700 acres. He owned all of this land in here. 
his palatial home. It was told to be the, the second most beautiful home in America. The White House in Washington, DC was the most beautiful home in America. And so he, he didn't want to have suffer gawkers and noise and soot. So Bonaparte sued the Camden and Amboy Railroad. And they had legislation that said they could take over, they could eminent domain, take land by eminent domain. Bo Joseph Bonaparte was a lawyer in Italy and France and Spain. He knew what eminent domain meant. It meant that the government could take land, but not a railroad, not a company. A company can't take your land. Only the government can take the land for the purpose of uh, betterment of the people. So he was going to sue them, and the candidate Emily realized they were going to lose the lawsuit. And so they compromised with him, and what they did was they put a great big thick cut right through the middle of Bordentown and then bypassed his farm, bypassed his, his palatial house, and they went on the flank of his farmland up to Crosswicks Creek and cross there. And so this cut through the middle of town, it's 30 feet deep, it's 1,700 feet long, and it cuts right through the heart of Bordentown. And so Bonaparte was pleased. They just had to change their route. So all this land, all the, the flank of the Crosswicks Creek is Bonaparte's property. And then all I know is it's 1,700 acres. I don't really know where this line is, but it's someplace in this area right here. So to, to, to construct this, they had to grub the right away, which means they had to remove trees and shrubs. They had to level the land, they had to lower hilltops, build up causeways. They had to create a 15 foot wide plan, path for putting the rails and the sleepers on. They had to dig drainage ditches, eight feet wide at the top, two feet wide at the bottom, three foot deep. They had to dig rail ditches, two ditches, 26 inches wide, 18 inches deep, and center, the center of the two ditches is five feet apart. They had to fill the rail ditches with ballast. They had to compact the ballast with an eight ton roller. They had to set stone sleepers of one about every three feet. They had to compact the sleepers with a one, one ton weight. They had to lay the iron rail and level it with wood shims. They had to chisel shim recesses. They had to chisel all these little things. They had to drill sp spike holes to spike the rail to the stone block. Then finally they could spike the rail to the stone block. This is an example of how they did it in 1905 to move soil. And in 1830, they moved it the same way. A horse could pull about one ton of sediment on dirt, not very much. So the men were working with shovels, dumping it into the horse cart, the cart would pull it and dump the dirt. Here's another example of men, a wheelbarrow and shovels and a horse and a cart. That's how the dirt was moved. They did use rails. In some of the engineering reports, the Camden Am engineering reports, they talk about in Bordentown using short railroads to carry the, the dirt because a horse can move one ton in soil but on rails, it can move three, four, and five tons. So you can put a lot more dirt for one horse to move. And when you have a lot of dirt to move, that's to your advantage. So they needed a profile. They needed about a 15-foot wide bed. They needed an eight-foot wide ditch that's two feet wide at the bottom and about three feet deep. So this is prepping, prepping the land. Then they had to dig these two ditches, five feet apart, two feet wide, foot and a half deep, and that's where they're going to put the, the ballast into. This is a drawing from 1838 by Gertzner, and he showed how they built the Camden and Amboy Eisenbahn Railroad. That's a German word in his publication. 
So they had dug these ditches five foot apart, filled it with smaller ballast on the bottom, a little more coarse ballast above that. And then they put the stone on it, a wood board, and then a rail, an iron rail. And longitudinally, they put the, the native soil. Then they had some light ballast, some heavy ballast. They put the stones in, and then they packed around the stones. Once the stones are in, more ballast. So these, rail, these stones are five feet across, and there's the rail on top with the board underneath it. And these stones are about three feet separated. Then they needed to have a two-wheeled cart. Gerstner only described it as having an eight-foot diameter, two wheels, with 70 steel rails that weigh eight tons slung underneath the car. And cart was dragged by mules over a half a mile of roadbed. This is my rendition of it. Um, I don't really know what it looked like. Just based on that, you could draw 20,000 different ways but they had to drag it for a week to compact the earth. Well, this would have only been done probably on causeways, fresh soil, because the earth, if you've ever dug down a couple of feet, it's very, very hard. You don't need to do that. This is the typical ballast that they used. And in this, I took this out of the Hamilton site in Hamilton Township, New Jersey but some of it is stocked in sandstone, some of it is granite, some of it is chickie's quartzite, some of it is the Jurassic diabase and basalt. And then they had other materials. So they used any, almost anything. So this would have all been hand broken ballast. This wasn't crushed with a machine. This is where you get five and 10 year old boys and girls just breaking rocks all days long. Here's some ballast from the, the uh, this is a quartzite and the, the falls of the Delaware in the Trenton and the Trenton barracks are made out of quartzite. This is from the Bordentown Township site. Um, there's schist and nice. I know that most of you are not geologists, but when I look at these, I can tell where these rocks came from. I know that they came from certain areas of the state, not other areas of the state. And then there's Stockton sandstone. Sometimes they use coarse grain stocked in sandstone, sometimes fine grain. To you, it doesn't mean anything. To me, it's a little bit of information. This is a picture of me and Bob and Kathy Patton digging in um, Heightstown. We're digging to see what the ballast is underneath these stone sleepers. And half the ballast is this Clarksburg Mountain conglomerate, the coastal plain conglomerate. And the other half is boulders that have been broken up into two inch pieces. So they use two types of ballast underneath these stone sleepers in Heightstown. Here's a sleeper, a stone sleeper. And you can see the coarse ballast here. You can see a finer ballast here. And you can see the native earth down here in the bottom. So they would have dug this ditch, laid down the fine stuff, fine ballast, laid down the coarse ballast, laid down the stone sleeper. They would have compacted this a little bit. So what is a stone sleeper? Well, there's about seven different types of stone sleeper. The reason why they call them sleepers is because they lay in a bed. They lay in a railroad bed, so they look like sleepers. And sometimes they made stone sleepers what look like our wooden ties of today. Sometimes they made stone sleepers that were stone rails. Sometimes they built stone walls three feet deep, two, four, three feet wide in the bottom, two feet high, two feet to the top. And then they built, built the rail on top of this stone wall. Sometimes they built a bunch of pillars. Sometimes they just laid a slab down and cut a chisel down the center of it. Sometimes they use thin pieces of rock. Sometimes they use thicker pieces of rock. But the Camden and Anvoy predominantly use this. They use a thick piece of rock, which is typically 20 inches by 20 inches by 8 to 14 inches thick, typically 10 inches thick. 
And so this is a typical block of stone that they would have used as a sleeper. How'd they query this? So this is obviously in the 1830s, there were no photographs. Photography didn't come around until about 1855. So these are obviously post 1855, it's in 1896. This is in Pennsylvania. They're quarrying Stockton sandstone here. You can see men for scale. These are not stone sleepers, they're just, but men would have quarried this rock, broken it to the proper size, and then with various type of devices, get it into a boat, not a, not a canal boat, but they would have got into a boat and they would have moved it down to Bordentown. Here's a quarry, Stockton Sandstone, another one. Again, they would have had some type of a crane with a hand-operated crane to move these stones from this quarry six, seven miles downstream. This is in Wilbertha, which is about where the Scudders Falls Bridge is in um, Clinton and Mercer County. And these are the Sing Sing prisoners. They're quarrying the marble at their particular, you can see the outfits that they're wearing. And it's just, it's, they brought them, used oxen to do the moving, they didn't use horses. Um, but it's just hard labor breaking that down. And here's a, an, an example of a quarry in downtown uh, Trenton. Um, these are all small quarry operations. It's you and your three brothers and your two sons that are operating these things. These are not big, big quarry operations like you would think. These are relatively small things. In Bordentown, they would have quarried uh, nice and quartzite. Um, these are just types of rock that exist out there. If you want me to go through that, that's a whole nother geologic story. So in Trenton right here, this is downtown Trenton. These are all the sites of quarries in Trenton. You go up by Wilbertha, where the police station is. These are larger quarries. And they capitalized in the Delaware and Raritan Canal. They would move stones around on those. But in the 1830s, they would have brought it to the Delaware River. And Bordentown was only five miles downstream of Trenton. So the Delaware River was their major transportation corridor to get stones from either Bucks County or stones from Mercer County. And to, to get the stones, to break them the exact size that they want, they would drill a bunch of small holes called plug and feather or pin or feather. And they would just, they're only two feet, two inches deep, two and a quarter inches deep, three quarters of an inch wide. And then you put these two feathers in here and you put this pin or a plug in between the feathers in each one of these holes. Then you could just tap one, two, three, tap one, two, three, four, tap one, two, three, four. You do this for five minutes and the stone will break right on a nice smooth plane. That's an example of pen and feather features that you're gonna see on a lot of the um, stone sleepers that are in the coastal plain. And this is their tools. That's their whole, they don't have air hammers. They don't have pneumatics, anything. It's a small hammer and a pen and a feather, and that's it. So how did they go about getting men to supply these stone sleepers? So they put in the Philadelphia Inquirer and in the New York City news newspapers, these stone wanted. They wanted stone blocks. And this, this is because this photocopying doesn't work so well. They wanted 30,000 stone blocks. They wanted 2,000 of them delivered to Camden, 2,000 to Bordentown, and 26,000 to Crosswicks Creek Wharf. The blocks had to be 18 by 21 by 10 to 13 inches thick. They also wanted another 20,000 blocks, not less than seven inches thick. Well, these would be used for building the bridges, building the causeways, building the uh, buildings. These are for building Camden and Amboy roadbed. They also wanted 30,000 running feet of stone rail. So these are usually six by six or eight by eight inches by five feet long. And that for any one contract, they didn't want to buy, deal with you unless you were going to deliver 
2,000 blocks. Well, they need to buy 100,000 blocks to build this whole thing. And they wanted delivery by January 1, 1831. So this advertisement went in, out in October, October 21st, 1830. So he wanted to have all these blocks delivered in the wintertime, probably because it's easier to move stone blocks on a sled than it is to move it on a, a cart a car or wheel. So Robert Stevens, as you know, he went to England and on his, on his boat ride over, that's when he whittled the, uh, out of a board, what he thought the T-rail should look like, the Stevens type T-rail. He received a letter from his brother Edmund, who was the treasurer for the company. After this advertisement that I just showed in the previous slide, he wrote a letter to his brother and he said, the least expensive stones in the Bordentown area are 33 cents per stone. In the South Amble area, they were 44 and a half cents per stone. Well, here you had, you could get them from Bucks County and Mercer County. Here you had to get them for South Amble, you had to get them from New York City or a little north of New York City. So there was a price difference. The Camden Amboy started to purchase stones from Sing Sing Prison in late 1832. These are in the fall of 1830, and they were paying 27 cents per stone from Sing Sing Prison. Well, this, this was a problem because the, it was a legal problem for the prison system because there was a lot of taxpaying quarry owners they couldn't sell stones for 27 cents. They could only sell them for 44 cents because it cost them that much money. But the prison was losing money at 27 cents also because at that time, men who went to prison had to pay their fair share to be in prison. And they had to work to get that. It wasn't, wasn't the same as laws are today. So you had to produce something while you were in prison and stone quarrying was a thing. So now you've got the state prison arguing with the quarry owners because they're undercutting the quarry owners. The other problem is this marble at Sing Sing Prison was an inferior marble and it easily rotted. There was another problem, the prison cholera epidemic showed slowed the quarrying and the delivery. Well, they could, the they, in, the, in all the literature I read, the Camden and Amboy was, was complaining because the Sing Sing prison wasn't delivering fast enough. Well, that's probably not. The Camden and Amboy was just too frugal to purchase from other quarries. They didn't want to pay this. They wanted to pay that. The stones had a problem, too. They didn't keep gauge very well. They were very heavy. An average stone weighs 400, 450 pounds. Installation is slow because you got to drill holes in stone and it's not easy. So the Camden A converted Camden Amboy Railroad eventually converted to wood rails because lots and lots and lots of railroads in the 1830s in England use wood rails. There's no reason why there shouldn't be rails used of wood in New Jersey. So how did they move the rails once they got them? They used just uh, stone sleds. This is a typical stone sled. Um, and it's, it's, they're good in the summertime, but they're much, much better in the winter town. So when the John Bull was reassembled in August of 1831, it was reassembled on stone sleepers and rails, but I'm not sure that they were the stone sleepers that I'm going to show for most of the talk. And I'll go on that in a little bit. To move the stone sleepers, you either use these type of tongs, you might use three or four, three, two, three or four groups of men, or if your horse was pulling it, you'd use this type of set of tongs to move those around. And you'll see scar marks like that on them. They would lay the stones out in this pattern right here. And it was just, they're just stones with no holes in them. And generally they're about 3.2 feet apart. But every 16 feet, the stones had to be exactly 16 feet apart because the rails were exactly 16 feet. 
So they were very, very deliberate about laying this stone and this stone and less deliberate about filling in the gaps in between. So they would predetermine that they were going to use, these were always set up very, the stones were five feet apart and about 3.2. If they had small stones, and there's one place along the Camden and Amboy where they use small stones, they would have the stones deliberately 16 feet apart, but they'd have five small stones as opposed to four small stones in between. So I call this a one, four combination. One followed by four, one followed by four. Call this a one, five combination. One followed by five, one followed by five. They were about 2.7 feet apart between them. Then they would lay the stone rail, the iron rail on top of the stones. But they're every 16 feet. But you can see that the stones aren't actually perfectly level if you look at a side view. So they have to fill in this gap a little bit. Obviously, this is exaggerated quite a bit. But they would have to fill in that gap. So this is for a 1-4 one, a, a one combination. This is for a 1-5, so it's same same issue. But to fill in that gap right there, level it, what they would do is they would put a board down. Well, the top of these stones is pretty uneven. So they would chisel a rectangle in there. And that rectangle is nine inches by 16 inches. And they would lay a wood plank in there. The type of wood they typically use was black locust because it didn't rot very easily. And the wood served three functions. The first function was a shim to level the rails. Sometimes the wood was only a half an inch thick. Sometimes it was two inches thick. It also acted as a spacer to prevent the rail, which was iron, from sitting on top of the, st on the stone. Because that abrasion would both hurt the rail and abrade the rail and abrade the stone. And it also cushioned or lessened the jolt on the train rides by doing this. The Boston and Lowell Railroad didn't use these wood planks. They just put the rails right on top of the steel. And every evening they had to tighten all the bolts on the train because it would just rattle the bejesus out of the, the trains. And so it was much more important for them to protect the train. They weren't too concerned about the riding public. So they would have had these recessed rectangles. They would have laid the board in it. They would have put the rail on top of it. And then they would have spiked it in here. Spike, they would have drilled two holes to spike it and they set them off. So when I, when I get to a stone sleeper, I measure its length, its width. And its length is always, length to me is always along the line of the rail. This is its length, this is its width, the length of the cut for the, the apron, the width of the cut for the apron, and the spacing between the holes and the diameter of the holes. So this is what it would look like on a top view. On a side view, there was ballast around it, a stone block, a wood board, the T-rail is above it, and spikes were shoved into it. Now, the only thing I ever see is the spike, all this, all this paraphernalia on the top is long gone. So now we have this pattern. Whenever there were two rails that joined together, they would have had to have four holes. So this 16 foot rail, and then in between it, these about 3.2 foot apart, these inner runs. So this is a one, four combination, a one, four combination. But the south rail, this is the north rail, this is the south rail, they would offset it by two stones. So you didn't have the end of both rails at the same point. They do the same thing today with wood sleepers or you know, with wood ties. They offset the joints between the rails just so you don't get that thump, thump, thump. You get this kind of clickety clack sound. So after the stones were set, Gertzner said, 
They had one ton weights that were dropped 20 feet onto a thick, thin, thick six inch thick board and the weight was lifted by mules. So I drew this, I have no idea what this piece of equipment looked like, but it's a 20 foot high, you drop this one ton weight onto a rail and then you move 3.2 feet and you do it again, move 3.2 and give it three blows with each one for setting it. So when I would measure these, there's a, this is a two hole, a four hole sleeper. This is a two hole where the forward hole is left forward. And this is where the forward hole is right forward. So they had three styles of holes on here. And I would, I would measure the distance between on a four hole, this measure, this measure, and that measure. Typically this is four, typically that's three, typically this five. But sometimes these numbers were off. This would get as big as six inches. This would get as big as four inches. And this would get as big as four and a half inches. I measure the depth of the holes. I can't always measure them, but generally they're five and a half inches deep. And the whole diameter is generally one inch. Almost always for the two holes, two hole sleepers, it's four and a half inches. Sometimes I'd find spikes in the holes. The spikes were almost always square spikes. These are just features that I'd measure. I did this on 2,100 sleepers and it, it gave me so, some confidence in my number. I measure things like pin and feather features, the spacing between them, the depth of them. I measure, there's also, they use this crowbar type feature for chiseling, um, breaking the rock into smaller pieces, a large rock into, on uh, uh, different type rays. This is just one inch units here. I never found the wedge feature and the pin and feather on the same sleeper. It's always separate. And you could almost map which core it came from by having this or this. I also would find letters on them. You can see a six here, an I here. Um, this is the letter B, the letter H, number nine, or it could be a six letter I and a plus, the letter O, letter P. And I, this is one of the fancy ones, A, R, a V. And this is a J on its side. So I found about 60 stones with these. And my interpretation, and this is totally an interpretation, is this is how the guys got paid. A guy named Ignatius or whatever his name was, all he knew was how to make a, the letter I. He would put chisel that on there. And he said that meant he had done all the, the work on this. Ivan did all the work on this. Uh, a guy who knew how to make a nine or a G did it all on his, his uh, and that's how he got paid. That's what I think. You'd also find examples of where they didn't put thick enough boards on him. And so you could see where the rail wore away on the stone sleeper. The way up, and it's always the same width. These are exactly, and you can see how the rail would have worn away this section, been pinned down here. Sometimes the rails left iron staining on him, but I would measure these features also. So the different types of rock, this is what a nice looks like. It has this, what's called foliation, uh, this linear pattern in it. It's it's formed under a lot of pressure and you get that pressure, all the mineral flakes grow in a, a certain direction. And this is a, and there are many, many types of gneisses, but I'm just gonna, for this presentation, just talk about this. This is a typical marble. It's a white stone. It's made out of calcium carbonate. It's a very pretty stone when it's freshly broken, but it'll pick up staining quite easily. This is a typical sandstone, Stockton sandstone. And this is a typical conglomerate. Sometimes the pebbles are small. Sometimes the pebbles could be almost two inches by two inches. But this is a typical coastal plain conglomerate. So you can see that easily that there's three ty four types of rock here. I could have put up 12 or 14, but I think I would have bored the bejesus out of you guys. So. So these are the, these are, this is how it was built. Now we're going to go on what features remain. So 
I measured and recorded and photographed 2,100 sleepers. So now I'm going to show you what exists today. So this is Bordentown. This is Burlington County right here. This is Mercer County right here. And this is Middlesex County right here. And when I'm doing this, I just work by township. So in Borden, Burlington County, there's Fieldsboro, Bordentown Township, and Bordentown City. New Jersey has this interesting type of, we have what are called donut communities. So East Windsor is a donut community. Heightstown is a donut hole community. So there's an East Windsor Southwest, and there's an East Windsor Northeast. There's a Monroe Southwest, Jamesburg, and Monroe Northeast. And so I, I break these, this part of town different from this part of town, and it just makes it easier on me. And so I'm going to talk about them like that. But we'll look at what stones, sleepers, stone features still exist in Burlington County. So Burlington County, Fieldsboro, here's nearly 100 stone sleepers, and these were used as a tidal breakwater. They were stacked up, they're starting to fall apart, but it's just a tidal breakwater to protect the shoreline on the Delaware River. Behind, your, behind the photographer, me, is the Delaware River. And so at low tide, you can see this. At high tide, the water is up to this level right here. Bordentown, Burlington County, Bordentown Township, they just dumped them, piles of 16, piles of eight and eight. They just dumped them along the Delaware River. But they also built a stone wall in the forest on the far side. And they built it along the river line. Today, the river line, Delaware River line, they built stone walls. And this stone wall is about five, 600 feet long. And it's about, I've dug down and it's five stones deep. So there's hundreds and hundreds of stone sleepers here. Sometimes the railroad um, workmen dug them up and they just dump them in the woods. Sometimes after they dug them up, they build these little stairs for a, there's a drainage right below this just to prevent erosion. In Bordentown, Burlington County, Bordentown City, they, they, this, this is Black's Creek. This is just an abutment to prevent erosion of the shoreline next to Black's Creek. This is where they've used them on a historical marker. This is, this is a separate, celebrates the 60th anniversary of the John Bull steam engine. This is a, just a, a historical display. In the Bordentown cut through the middle of town, this stone wall, when it was first built, it was only a knee wall. It was only three feet high. It was made out of Stockton sandstone. You can still see it down here. But they built this wall. It's around 12, 14 feet high. And they use stone sleepers. These are all stone sleepers right in the wall. If you go to the north side of Bordentown City and Bordentown Township Northeast, again, this is a uh, um, donut community. You, I saw a place that looked to me like it was original rail bed. So I dug down, I found one stone, I found another and another. And so I dug a full 16 feet of these and these stone sleepers, they go on for about 500, 600 feet. This is an example of where they were already exposed. They have slid, started to slide down a hill, but these are in situ stone sleepers. And this is on a causeway to go over Crosswicks Creek. So there's three different locations where I found in situ stone sleepers. In situ means in place. So that's what exists in Burlington County. Now we'll look at what exists in Mercer County, Hamilton, Robbinsville, East Windsor, Southwest, Heightstown, East Windsor, Southeast. So here are some stone sleepers. And this is the only place I found that one five combination. And here is a stone sleeper for the other, for, this is for the North Rail, this is for the South Rail. These are all in situ. 
These have just been dug up and pushed to the side of the railroad. These are called exit, they were out of place sleepers. This, I know this looks bad, but these were all exposed, sticking out of the modern riprap. This section of rail has not been used in 10 years. So I don't feel too bad about just sweeping them off. You go a little further north, and this section of rail now looks like this forest. They've stopped using this whole area. And this, these are all um, this 14 in situ stone sleepers. The other stone sleepers are likely underneath the rail, but I don't know that. And here is a modern pipe. It's just a ductile steel pipe. And they use stone sleepers in a few locations to build this culvert. In Robbinsville Township, I didn't find very many sleepers, but every place I dug where I thought there was a stone sleeper, I would find them. So I think I found thousands of stone sleepers, but I'm not about to dig a bunch of holes that are, this hole is about 18 inches deep. This one's about 12 inches and it's a bugger. You can see the black coal and then the red soil that they put on top of it. And then they would have put modern wood ties on top of this. This is very difficult digging and I don't enjoy digging a lot of holes. So, but it's, I did this for proof of concept. Are there really stone sleepers here? And when I would strategically locate my holes, I could say, yes, they are here. In East Windsor Township Southwest, I only found one sleeper, but it was right adjacent to Route 130. And I don't like digging. I'm a geologist, I'm not a licensed archeologist. I have permission from the historic preservation to look at these things. They don't like me doing a lot of rock. But just a, one dig here, one dig there for proof of concept, they don't have a problem with that because they're, they're learning something by me saying, listen, I found this here. When I dig up one stone out of a thousand, I feel that's a fair trade. When you go into Heightstown, Heightstown has five or 600 stone sleepers on display. They are absolutely a, a wealth of a place to go. This is a bunch in Day Park. They've lined them up. The actual ro roadway was up here, but they just lined them up just for display purposes. Sometimes they did a, a mo monument to a worthy citizen. Sometimes they used the stone sleepers as actual cityscape. This is a National Registry of Historic Places that Kathy Patton and I put together. Um, these are 22 stone sleepers in situ, right in the heart of uh, Heightstown. Heightstown, that, that, this site right here was originally exposed and Smith's, the Smithsonian came up and New Jersey State Museum came over to take a look at these stones. And they each brought, the Smithsonian brought back 32 stones. And these are the stones that they have in storage down at the Smithsonian. These are the stones that they have on display at the State Museum. There's another stone behind this spherical rock. They've also, Pine Creek Railroad at Alaire State Park, New Jersey Museum of Transportation, they have uh, 12 on display and they have in the woods another two or three that are um, not on display, but they put them out as, as best they could. In Heightstown, they also have at the, um, the Township Museum, they have two displays of stone sleepers. They've made park benches out of it in another park. And in Rocky Book Park, they have around 200 lining all the pathways and walkways through the park. Absolutely wonderful little field trip if you feel like doing that. If you go to East Windsor Northeast, that's that little part, the other part of it, there's in situ sleepers buried um, on both sides of Route 33, this a highway that's go through there. When they put in 33, they dug up about a couple hundred stone sleepers, not, not quite a couple hundred. There's 88 in this pile. And the Phillipsburg Railroad Museum, Story Museum, they took 40, 40 plus 42, I think, and they brought them up. And these are in their um, yard um, 
and they, and I've got permission to uh, go in their yard and measure all the characteristics of these stone sleepers. So we just finished with M Mercer County, Middlesex County is Cranberry, Monroe Southwest, Jamesburg, Monroe Northeast, Helmetta, Spotswood, East Brunswick, Sayreville, Old Bridge, Town Line. I'm just going to call it Sayreville, and then South Amboy. We'll look at some stone sleepers there. You'll notice that I've got these orange squares, orange rectangles, red dots. The orange rectangles means I found sleepers that are both in situ and ex situ, mostly ex situ, out of place. The red circles means I found sleepers that are in situ, they're in place. And so when I have these stone sleepers that are in situ, I start, because I live down in this area, I started doing, trying to understand how stone sleepers were laid in the ground. And by and by, I became pretty good at it. And so I didn't do as much work up here. Of course, going from this part of Monroe here, this is an active train track. So you don't want to do too much digging. You can kick something with your feet, but I don't want to walk around there with a shovel. So I didn't do a lot of digging in this area. Um, so in Cranberry Township, Middlesex, there's the museum. They have a nice display of four. When the New Jersey Turnpike was reconstructing a bridge over the Camden and Amboy Railroad, they exposed probably many stone sleepers. I only saw four of them. And I took photographs of them. I measured them. But a week later, they disappeared. I don't know what happened to them. And then somebody did some needed to do some construction of sewer lines or something at Cranberry Station. And they dug up seven of them. They just shoved them into the woods. So they're just sitting there. If you go to Monroe Township Southwest, they have this historic day farm. And they've built a very nice display of stone sleepers, putting rail on it. They, they didn't put the wood block on it. They made a memorial out of one of them. And if you look back here, you'll see stone sleepers. And that's this whole row. There's 85 stone sleepers there. It's a lovely display of stone sleepers. This is a, a nice county park, and you can go there anytime. There's 14 sleepers that were exposed when Hurricane Ida washed through about three months ago, two months ago. And this is one of the places where it washed through, washed through a little bit to the east of this particular site. But this shows them very nicely displayed. And the, what I did was I measured down from the rail because now I've got a flat surface and all of these stones are offset by an inch or two. And so I could estimate how thick the board was the, the apron, wood apron that they had to put on these so they could have a, a level rail go across those. They also, this picture is about 50, 100 feet up these railroad tracks. They also use stone sleepers to line this culvert here. Many of you have seen this photograph. John Kilbride brought me here, and I thank him immensely for showing me this site. And I looked at this site, and I, I've spent a lot of time I have probably 14 of these photographs taken in the 1930s, 1940s. And I started studying them. And I was thinking, why would a rail terminate right in the middle of no place? And I've got a bunch of pictures, and they just terminate in these odd places. They don't terminate on a two, a four hole stone sleeper. They terminate here, there, and other places. They have modern spikes. These are not the spikes that the Camden and Amboy used. Some of the stone sleepers are turned 90 degrees. Rather than this being a left forward, the rail would have been, been moving this way through it rather than this way. So I began to realize this is really a reproduction, much like you saw the reproduction in Cranberry or in um, Spotswood or the other communities around here. This is just, these rails were laid on top, 
many years after this, this was never found this way. And I just thought it was an interesting, a, a nice display, but it it is, it's, Is, these are this is around 200 sleepers that you can can look at. If you go to Middlesex County, their, their county park, they have a bunch of stone sleepers at the entrance. Uh, one of the men at the auto salvage yard said these are brought from the auto salvage yard because these are two miles or a mile away from the railroad. Unfortunately, only one or two of them has the holes up. All, most of them have the holes. They're upside down. In Spotswood and in Jamesburg also, there's a nice pile of 16 of them, 15, 16, that are in a Y, a railroad Y. Um, and then there's the Buckaloo Park Mansion. Um, they have a nice display out in front. Then they have some used as stepping stones in the back of the, the place. Buckaloo, if you read this whole thing right here, James Buckaloo was a contractor. He rented mules. He did digging. He did a bunch of contract work for the Camden, the Camden Namboy Railroad. In Middlesex County, Monroe Township Northeast, these are just a bunch of stone sleepers at an auto salvage yard. The thing that's interesting is this auto salvage yard is about five, six hundred feet away from the modern railroad. And this causeway, which is on the north side of the auto salvage yard, that's about 1,100 feet away from the modern railroad. So when the Pennsylvania Railroad realigned the railroad, they moved the railroad 1,000 feet to the northeast, or to the north, certainly, of this. And these are in situ stone sleepers on the top of the causeway. And these are close. You can even see some of the ballast on this causeway because they, uh, they did a lot of the excavating of the causeway to reuse the sediments for fill elsewhere. Um, when you get into the town of Helmetta, there's about five homes, six homes with stone sleepers on the front yard just as a piece of ornamentation. Around Helmetta Pond, they've used them as fill for the pond. In front of the Helmetta City Hall, they've got them as cityscape. And you can see the letter B on the side of this particular stone sleeper. These are marble, these are nices. If you go into Spotswood, there's a couple of homes with stone sleepers in the front yard. There's a culvert, they use stone sleepers as part of, for reconstructing. So um, there's Spotswood, this is a very, very well-known uh, Camden and Amboy Memorial. And there used to be a Budweiser plant and they had a 14, 16 stone sleepers, but they have since been removed. And I don't know where they are today. If anybody in the audience knows what happened to these Budweiser plant stone sleepers, I'd like to hear from you. You get into East Brunswick. So this is Spotswood down here and this is Sayreville. I found zero stone sleepers in this area. And as a matter of fact, in Sayreville, for the first half mile, I again found no stone sleepers. The, um, uh, the reports suggest that it was seven and a half miles of land that the Camden and Amboy didn't use wood sleepers. I'm not sure it's seven and a half miles. I think it's too long. I think it's about two and a half miles. And you get up into Sayreville um, near Cheesequake Road, just south of it, Hurricane Sandy just washed right down here and they washed this whole zone off. I just went by with this broom and I swept off a little bit of stuff. So you, this site now is it's pretty much all covered back up because they just bulldozed everything up. But this is absolutely a lovely collection of a, around 100 stone sleepers. On the north side of Cheesequake Road, you can see them. They're all at about a 20 degree angle. Um, I think it's when they put in the fiber optic line, they disturbed them. But these are in situ or nearly in situ stone sleepers 
along an active railroad. Uh, dirt bikes travel this all the time and they just expose them all the time. You get up into the village of South Amboy, they've used them as stone, stone sleepers as cityscape. They've also got a whole bunch of stone, about 75 stone sleepers where the former wharf was that they plan for future cityscape. Um, Hunter Research was asked to do some work on, on archeological dig and they unearthed the foundation of this building with a whole bunch of stone sleepers. Here's a corner of the building uh, with additional stone sleepers in there. They, they use reuse stone sleepers for building a wharf. The, the Raritan Bay is out in this area. Um, so this is a wharf, and you can see the, 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 the staining from low tide and high tide. You can see stone sleepers along the shoreline. That's Raritan Bay. The Camden and Amboy Wharf would have been out here. These are hundreds of stone sleepers at the bottom of the, that, were, that are always underwater at high tide. And you can see the, the barnacles and the seaweed that grows on top of these. I chipped this because I can't tell what type of rock it is, but you can see how white the chip is. So this is a marble. So I said, I've been, we've been talking about these iron rail stone sleepers for holding Stevens rail. The distance between these two holes is four and a half inches. These, are seven and a half inches, the holes between these. And there's only one location where I found seven and a half inch hole spacings. And that location is in at the Stewart's Wharf or the, um, the, the Delaware River Wharf, Bordentown Depot. And I've seen the stone sleepers that they have up in, um, for the Mohawk and Hudson that use wood rails. And I've seen the stone sleepers for other wood rails. And typically they have a seven to eight inch gap between the holes. So you could put a six inch wood beam in there and then have angle irons. So this is how it was likely set up. You had a stone block, you put a six by six block of wood on it, rail of wood, You'd put angle irons on it. You'd spike into the stone. You'd spike into the wood. And then you'd put a strap rail on the inside. And because there's 80, 85 of these type of stone sleepers on the Delaware River Wharf, I think that the John Bull was reassembled on these sleepers. And I don't think it was assembled on this one. I also found three stone rails. And this is what a stone rail looks like in Fairmont Park in Philadelphia for the Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad. And it is a stone rail. They cut a little notch out of it. They put on a strap rail and they spike that strap rail down. And you can see this, once this strap rail gets laid on there, and the trains go over it for two years, it smooths out this rock tremendously. And you can see the spike hole. There's a smooth line right there and there's a single spike hole. And the spike holes are about every 18 inches here. So I have to assume they're about every 18 inches on the Camden and Amboy. So there's at least three types of rails used by the Camden and Amboy. There's the T-rail or the Stevens T-rail which is a stone block, a wood board, and a rail, and spikes holding it down, and there's ballast around it. Then there's a stone block with a wood rail, with a strap rail on top of it, angle iron, spikes into the side. Did they have ballast around it? I don't know, because I've never found these in situ. And then they had the strap rail, or the stone rail, where it was, was there ballast around it? I don't know. And they had a strap and a spike on it. So these are the three types of rails or the three types of stone blocks I found for the Camden and Amboy Railroad. This is a 
you're going to have to bear with me. But envision this going through Burlington County, Mercer County, and Camden County. And these are, this row is all the different types of rocks I found. This row is all the nice rocks that I found. So I found nice at all of these locations. Nice is that metamorphic rock with the, has the straight lines through it. This row is all the marble rocks I found. Now, rocks that I find at the wharf on the, on the Delaware River and rocks that I find at the wharf in South Amboy, they can come from anywhere because if they're doing repair, they just bring them to the inn and they dump them and they reuse them. So I don't put a lot of faith in my statistics for this, but it's mostly marble in this area right here. There's very little marble in this area. There's conglomerate, this gray, and it's only in East Windsor. There's a little bit of conglomerate here and a little bit of conglomerate here. This red sandstone, whoops. This red sandstone is mostly in Mercer County and Burlington County. There's very little of it in Middlesex. I also sound gabbros and granites. We're not going to go over that stuff just because it, it, it's too time consuming. But my thought is that these gneisses and these sandstones all come from the Delaware Valley. And these gneisses and these marbles all come from the Hudson Valley. And so I've got a and if you look at these marbles or these gneisses, they have a different signature than these gneisses. And that's why I say that. I, I'd have to do an awful lot of work to prove it, but that's my, my running hypothesis. You'll also notice there's no stone sleepers in this area right here. And that's about two and a half, three miles. And this is the zone that he said there were seven miles where there's no stone sleepers. And I can't, I, I'm having a little trouble with that. So I would find, when I would find these, I would map the four holes and two holers. And it, eventually I came up with all these different patterns, but it, what came consistent was that there was an offset between the four holers and Took a little while to work that through, but I, I'm quite sure that's correct. I would like to see if I, if some archaeologists were to were to do this, they would probably go through with ground penetrating radar and find out where all the sleepers are and do a full explore, exploration. I only dug up stones that I could see. How about the bridges? Well, you can see this is the red sandstone, these wasiers on the, on the arch. This is that arch right here in Bordentown. This is the most famous. This is the oldest railroad bridge in New Jersey. And it's probably in the top four or five oldest railroads bridges in the United States. This is a drawing of it from 1942. And this is a drawing of it that was on their stocks. So the stocks that they sold in the 1830s included the John Bell steam engine, the train, and this bridge. That's how important this bridge was to them. There's a keystone on it that says 1831 on both sides of it. The interior of it is mostly just, there's three or four different styles of Rome. These are all, these voiciers are obviously very well formed rock. Of course, you can see where they've been broken when the train hits them. But th there was no cement when they built this thing. These were, these were um, dry laid stones. They covered, tried to plaster them over, but um, th there's no real cement in these things. You don't build stones like this. The DOT wants to take, tear this bridge down. I'm not really pleased with that idea, but they, they say that it's a dangerous bridge, but they... Uh, I don't, they're saying it and proving it are two completely different things. 
There's in Bordentown, there's the Prince Street Bridge and the Second Street Bridge. This is the Prince Street Bridge. This is an original wall. This wall has been made, moved north because this was originally a one lane bridge and they wanted to make it a two wing. So they tore down the, the north wall, moved it another 20 feet north and rebuilt it. This is the Second Street Bridge. Um, these are original walls right here. And some guy in 1832 with initials SBI, very neatly chiseled into the wall, his initials and the date 1832. This is a letter I received um, from a friend of mine, uh, Peter Tucci, uh, who collects uh, um, paraphernalia from Joseph Bonaparte. And when William Cook, the engineer for the um, Camden and Amboy Railroad designed his culvert, this is his culvert today, they've rebuilt it. He designed it with ballast on the top, balusters on the top. It was a palatial looking this is just a tiny stream. Tiny streams like this usually have a 36 inch hole. This is a, a full 10, 12 foot diameter. It was designed so that uh, Joseph Bonaparte could ride a carriage through this tunnel to bring it to the rest of his farm. This was a very, very special bridge. This is the high bridge that when the John Bowl ran for the first time in September of uh, 31, um, it would have gone underneath this bridge. The bridge obviously doesn't, just the abutments exist. I can imagine people standing on top of this bridge watching the train go underneath them. The, north abu the, the south abutment is an original abutment. The north one, again, has been moved northward so that the, they could put two rails in the pass through this, this gap. This is a, a bridge abutment to cross Crosswicks Creek. It's the west abutment, there's a west abutment. And I found on this area, the number is 83. And I was thinking, 83, what the heck is 83? What happened in 18, this is after the Civil War. Then I realized there's a one here and a one here. So it's 1831, but holy Moses. And then I see this letter B right here. This photograph, because I don't like to take the lichen off here, there's a J right here, J, B. And I'm thinking, John Bull. Well, that makes perfect sense. And I said, John Bull, why would they call a bridge that the John Bull steam engine went over? And it just didn't make any sense to me. What would, maybe it's just somebody's, you know, Johnny Bell or Jerry Blavitt. And this is what the, I think the culvert looked like. This was it had an arch front. It had pillars on either side of it, had wings going out to the side, had a date stone and JB on the sides of it. The upper part has an altar-like second tier. This is a rather ornate bridge, especially if you look at the Mercer County Bridge, the Mercer County Bridge, flat wall, flat wall, and just this flat surface up here. This is a really, not a very ornate Brit, nor ornate abutment. You can see the wharf that was here. And they would have, this is my rendition of what the, the undercarriage of the bridge and how it would have worked. I really have no idea what it looked like. And so here is the Bordentown side, beautiful arched front pillars, JB on it. And here is the rather less ornate bridge. This is a 450 foot long trestle. This was all farmland and the swamp land. This is Crosswicks Creek winding through this swamp, this land, this agricultural land. And then I realized JB also stands for Joseph Bonaparte. So I'm beginning to think that either he or one of his laborers put a JB on it. It could just be a Johnny Bell or some guy named JB, but it could be Joseph Bonaparte. And when the steam engine didn't go across this, because they had a lot of horses, 
I imagine what the horses were like. This is 30 feet high going across this 300 foot thing. It must have been quite a, uh, quite a trip. You'll also see sticking in the water, here you can see the crib wharf and you can see the um, wood beams that, are, that supported the, either the wharf or the trestle beams, uh, the, the piers that held up the bridge. A little further north in, in Hamilton Township, you'll see the downstream side and the upstream side of a stone culvert has a stone as a brick arch and stone culvert bottom. Um, this is rather small. You can see me on a scale there. It's about three feet high. That's a little weird walking through there, but you can do it. And if you go a little bit to Mary's Run, you'll again see this. Oops. You'll see the stone base with a brick arch. And I don't include in this presentation, but there's one at the, uh, there's another small one. It's all collapsed, but it's at the uh, store at the wharf on the Delaware River. They also, this particular one, they've got some rather large limestone blocks right in the front of it. And that's typical of post-Civil War construction. So they've added these stone blocks here to what was an original, um, the original bridge. And here you can see some wood posts, wood pilings underneath a poured concrete bridge. And this crosses Assenpink Creek. If you go down to the Delaware River, Bordentown Depot, the Bordentown, they called it Stewart's Wharf. Um, at low tide, you're going to see all of this crib wharfing right here. There's just these crib wharfing. And the crib wharfing, it's, it's this ladder type feature goes out, another one here, another one here. And then there's all this crib wharfing right here. And these are all filled with re relatively large cobbles. The cobbles have been moved around by the ice and whatnot. Up, up in the higher area, it's mostly fine-grained sands and silts and things like that. But this is the, the, the construction of a crib bridge is like that. And the, the features that I find interesting about this is the stone blocks with the seven inch holes are all located right here. The spikes that hold this part together are different than the spikes that hold this part. So when they bought this piece of property, this wharf to have their steamboats land, this was probably the original wharf. This was added on. And because low tide is at this point, they couldn't pull their boats up to this wharf. So they built a long jetty to go out into deep enough water. And that is what's, what we have in this area. Of course, this area, I can't, I, I don't go into four feet, five feet of water to measure stuff, but this is, um, that's what I'm, I, I think is going on. This is the railroad tracks for the river line. This is all forested area. This down here is all forested area. And this is where they built, this area is the Bordentown Depot where they built steam engines and things like that for the Camden and Amboy Railroad. I found a couple of pieces of um, rail. This is a piece of that rail on top of a modern rail. I found the uh, one piece of this unit, which would have tied the two together. I'm not sure what their names are. This would have been, you can see a hole there, 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 and there. This would have been a plate when they put two rails together, they would sometimes put a steel plate underneath on top of the board just to prevent the um, board from breaking. And this is a typical spike. And I found 20 or 30 of these types of spikes. And it's just a very small head on it. It doesn't have that mushroom type head, offset mushroom type head of modern rails. Joint bar, that's what this thing's called. If you go to the New Jersey State Museum in Trenton, there was a guy by the name of Samuel Roberts that between 18, he, he collected all of these different type of rails used by the Camden and Amboy Railroad. It's an impressive collection. 
And this part right here is the rails that they used in the 1830s. And I've highlighted that right here. So this is the typical Stevens type rail. You can see how it's kind of got that little slant on it. And these are the typical strap type rails. I found a piece of this and I found a piece of this. And then there's another piece of equipment and it's, it's kind of an interesting piece of equipment, um, but it needed a lot of hardware for it to work. And that's what this lecture has been about. The hardware that this train had to ride on, they put 31 miles of that hardware up. It was a tiny train. This, this is a, to give you some perspective of how small it is. Um, there's no, this is a, happens to be a photograph of it on stone sleepers. So I've been looking at stone sleepers for the Camden and Amboy Railroad, but I've also been looking at it for a number of other railroads, about 30, 30 35 railroads in Northeastern United States and in Kentucky used stone sleepers. Some of them used them for this 31 miles here, 81 miles here, but others used only for 12 miles and 16 miles. And many of them only used them for a mile or two or three. And so I've been, some of them I've visited and I haven't found any stone sleepers. Some I found scores and hundreds of stone sleepers. This is the list of 35 stone railroads, 34 really, that I found stone sleepers on. So the summary of this is that the stone sleepers for the Camden Nambury Railroad came from at least seven different geologic reasons, regions, and they likely used 10 to 20 quarries to get all these. It was built using approximately 100,000 stone sleepers. I've located 2,100 stone sleepers that are actually exposed and I can measure and do things. I've located another 10,000, but they're buried under 10 to 20 inches of, of uh, forest litter, uh, railroad material. The first railroad in the world to use the modern Stevens type rail was the Camden and Amboy. Most railroads today are using Stevens type rail. I think only about two and a half miles of the track used wood ties, not and not stone sleepers when it was first built. The stone abutments and the wood piles for seven or the piles, the posts, for seven of the original build bridges still remain someplace. Only one carriage bridge is still in use, and the New Jersey DOT is investigating its removal. They've put together a 600-page report concerning its removal. Um, four, four hole stone sleepers are always exactly 16 feet apart. Two hole stone sleepers are about three and 3.2 feet apart. All the ballast underneath the stones is all hand broken. I also found 80 sleepers that st support wood rails. The John Bull was likely re reassembled on the wood rails at the, at the dock. And I found three stone sleepers that are stone rails. They were likely used by the reports in the Robbinsville area. But that's it. I'd like to thank Richie King of Tri-State, and I'd particularly like to thank John Kilbride, who is a Canton Namboy Railroad historian. There are many other people that can be thanking. If you have any questions, any comments, if you information you want to know, please contact me. I'm a member of the Delaware Valley chapter of the New Air, the National Railroad Historical Society and the West Jersey chapter, and I can be contacted at this email address. Any questions? Thank you, Pierre. That was a very uh, informative, very thorough presentation. And uh, I learned a lot that I didn't know. Yeah, Pierre, you're the perfect one to give this presentation because the geologic uh, examination of those sleepers was is terrific. Um, I too didn't believe they all could have come from New York. And because I had the, the few stones that I've seen, none of them were marble, you know? Um, Something that uh, modern railroads didn't learn from history, and maybe because you weren't there to tell them about it. But when Amtrak first developed the concrete tie in the early 19s or in the 1970s, they did not do put anything between the rail and the tie. 
And the first concrete ties did not last more than a few years because of rail seat abrasion that you talked about that the Camden and Amboy discovered. So all concrete ties today have a, a Teflon or a rubber pad between the rail and the, and the tie itself. I didn't know that. Yeah, that was uh, um, for a couple of years, I was the engineering editor at Railway Track and Structures Magazine. So I talked to just about every one of the uh, track people in the, the big railroads and, uh, and did a lot of research in the um, concrete ties in the beginning. And, uh, you know, today they're pretty good. You know, they figured, they figured out all these shortcomings that the Camden and Amboy apparently learned on their own, you know. <laughs> Um, we've had so, several questions come in here. Um, okay. I'll kind of moderate them for you. Um, someone asks, what kind of speeds were attained on these rails? It would seem the strap rail would be pretty slow for safety. Um, the speeds, if you think about it this way, um, to go from Philadelphia to New York would have taken generally three days. You would have gotten on a steamboat, got to about um, Bordentown, and then you would have gotten in a stagecoach, and the stagecoach would have brought you about to Robbinsville, five, seven miles. Then you'd have to spend the night, and then you get on another stagecoach. You'd be brought to South Amboy, and then you'd have to catch a ferry boat to New York. So two and a half to three days to go there. They were doing this in eight, nine hours with the railroad. So the speed of the railroad was just, you know, you could go to New York City and come back in one day. Be a long day, but you could do it. They talk about the, 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 the railroad going at 15 and 20 miles an hour, but they also talk about them doing 30 miles an hour. So um, those are the type of things where you know the horse the horse railroad would only go at walking speed they never they never ran them and if you go on the columbia and um the philadelphia and columbia railroad that was a torturous that was just following contour lines they didn't straighten it out here they at least tried to straighten it out so the horses couldn't walk and it was illegal to go faster than a walking speed of a man on the philadelphia and columbia railroad but this one you could go at um 15 or 20 miles an hour. Yeah, Pierre, the, the John Bull was only capable of 20 or 25 miles yeah. an hour at the most, you know. Um, well, the interesting, the John Bull didn't have a backup. So, or it did have a backup, but it had no brakes. And so, you know, they talk about it falling off the tracks all the time. I found one place where I found, in essence, a loop where they, it's a 60 foot diameter loop where the train would have turned around. So. Oh, wow. Um, someone asked, were the strap rail spikes countersunk? Since I've never found a strap rail, everything I've read about them is, yes, they were countersunk. Okay. Um, uh, which railroad in Washington does do I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, which railroad in Washington, D.C. used stone sleepers? The, <clears throat> it wasn't Washington, D.C. It was the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad used stone sleepers for the first 27 miles. And they used some of those stone sleepers to build bridges on the Baltimore and Washington Railroad. Okay. Um, what was the original gauge of the Camden and Amboy? Five feet. Okay. Um, a lot of great comments came in here. Um, we had someone tuning in from the United Kingdom. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I just finished reading uh, Bertram's book. Bertram, what's his last name? It was an absolutely fascinating read. Uh, he, he wrote, let me see, what's his name? Bertram Baxter, Stone Blocks and Iron Rails. He wrote that in, I think, 1964 in Great Britain. He wrote all about the pre-1830 railroads of, uh, and the stone sleepers. It was a fascinating read. Wow. 
Um, someone asked a question, I'm going to rephrase it a little bit, but when did they phase out the stone sleepers and transition to wood ties? During construction, almost every long railroad phased out of using stone sleepers during construction. They were, it would take two or three years to build, so they went through two or three winters, and the railroads of England did not have to deal with the heavy, heavy frost of New England, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. And the frost here just did a, such weird things to the stones, uh, shifting them up and down, um, that they had to realign them constantly. And as a result, they, the, Britain had been using stone and wood for 100 years already, but the philosophy of John Stevens and Edwin Stevens was to build a permanent railroad. And since uh, creosote wasn't invented until about 1838, the, 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 stone, the wood rails would rot in four or five years in the ground. So they tried different techniques of preserving wood. And one was to drill a bunch of holes in it and fill the holes with salt. The salt would per, um, permeate the wood the other method was to char the wood because char wood doesn't rot as quickly. So they tried different things and it wasn't until they came up with a creosote method painting that on that they were able to be confident, have a, a permanent railroad as uh, John Stevens wanted, Robert Stevens wanted. Yeah, Pierre, did John Stevens railroad in Hoboken that he operated a steam engine on in 1825, was that a sleeper railroad? You know, he had a, a patent in, in that, let me see. Yeah, he had a patent he put out in 1824 on railroad bed construction. And that patent shows stone sleepers. And it shows two, two styles of road bed construction. One with stone sleepers and one with wood sleepers. And... So my feeling is if in 1824, he takes out a patent on two types of rail, he would have used both types of rail on building his circular track and building his linear track uh, closer to the Hudson River. So I never have read anything where he, what type of a track he used. They just say he used wood rails, but they don't say what he had, whether the wood rails were on earth or were on stone sleepers. But since he had these patents, I have to believe he used both the, the sub assembly of both stone and wood. Yeah, there's only one known illustration and I was trying to look for it while you were talking and I couldn't find it, but uh, I have, have it in my files downstairs. I'm, I'm trying to wonder what that was. And also you mentioned William Cook. Um, the New Jersey state geologist in the 1860s and 70s was a George Cook. I wonder if they're related or if George was the son of William. I don't uh, know. No, George Cook, you know, the Cook campus at Rutgers University is named after George Cook. I've never heard anybody putting those two names in the same as being relatives of one another. George, okay. Cook, George Cook grew up in, I think, Hunterton counts. County. And I think William Cook is a New York State resident, but I'm not positive on that. George Cook was from Hunterton County. His uh, mm -hmm. Before he was a state geologist, he was involved in their annual reports, and he was listed as Hunterton County. Yeah. The, 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 the thing that I find interesting on this whole thing is that George Cook didn't start teaching geology, and geology was not taught at Rutgers until about 1854. So until about 20 years after the railroad was completed. And um, Princeton University didn't get a geology professor until about 1854 also, it was a guy named Guyow. And so the New Jersey Geological Survey started in 1835, so two years after that. So this is the first time that you could move massive amount of coal from Pennsylvania over the Morris Canal and their inclined plane, and their inclined planes all had stone sleepers, or you could bring 
coal across the state of New Jersey, or you could bring brownstones, or you could bring iron ore, or you could bring the marl. And so now that you can move mass amounts of geology material, it became necessary to know where all those economic deposits of ore were. And so that's why the geological survey was formed because the railroads enabled the, and the canals enabled them to move massive amounts of material. And some of them, some of the reports are, are voluminous in documenting this stuff, you know, and, and they keep track of what the railroads are doing because a lot of the, the annual totals of what got moved were based on the railroad tonnages. Yeah. Um, a few more questions that came sure. in. Um, was freezing an issue with the sleepers, given that they had drilled holes? Um, no. Well, I've noticed that the weaker rocks, so rocks have, you know, this rheologic character. They, they can break easily or they're not break easily. And it's, it's just that some internal feature. And when you look at a suite of 40 rocks or 100 rocks up at, at the... Um, at the cut in uh, just south of Jamesburg. The only ones that are broken are the marbles. They, 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 the two sets of holes will behave like pin and feather features. So yes, there, and, I, and I, I never know whether the breakage is caused by freezing in those holes or it's just caused by just a weak, cheap rock or some other feature. They, they talk about um, if you if you put in a, a tree nail that's too big into the wood hole before they had dynamite and before they had steel a lot of times they would just drill the holes and then put oak in very tightly in there and then put mud on mud channels and then they'd fill the channel with water and that would cause the oak to expand and that would break the rock so there, there's a lot of reasons why the rocks break, but the, the frost heave was mostly losing gauge. Okay. Um, do you know what a typical sleeper weighs? 450 pounds. The, if you measure its volume and multiply it times 2.65 and then multiply it times the weight of water. So if water weighs 84 pounds a cubic foot, and so a block of rock will weigh 2.65 times 84 pounds. Okay. But um, that, that bridge that wants to be replaced, um, where is that? You, I, downtown Bordentown. It is downtown Bordentown. Now, yes, question that might be probably better taken offline, if we organized a little tour of some of this stuff, would you be willing to help us with that? Absolutely. All right. And then um, is, is there already, or are you willing to help out on, say, a, a little uh, published guide of this stuff, of where these things are, and, you know, or, or has that already been done? Um, well, I, I've already, we've already published for the National Park Service the site that is in Heightstown. It's a national historic site. I have written a 25-page paper for the Archaeological Society of New Jersey, and I submitted that. And um, Richard Veet, who is the president of the organization, has accepted it, and they're going through the process of getting that published. I've also written a 25-page paper, and I submitted to the National Railroad Historical Society on the 35 railroads that used stone sleepers. That's been accepted, and that will be published whenever the queue permits it to be. I'm not sure what it is. And I have, a, I have one other idea about publishing for the Camden and Amboy for the the cut in Bordentowns. The bridge is one thing, the cut is another. Uh, Joseph Bonaparte, the whole sh rigmarole were there. But I, I think that if there, I don't have a good solid feel of whether people are interested in this. 
because I've just been, I've been talking to myself at my dining room table for the last half hour and have no idea. I don't get any feedback other than this, this last five minutes. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's conceivable that something could be. Well, well, it's a, you couldn't see it because about every minute or so, there's a comment coming from somebody because uh, they're showing up on my display. Um, <laughs> Well, I'm glad to hear that this stuff's getting published. If you could tip us off and when it's available, we'd be interested. I know a lot of our members would be interested. And uh, if we can come up with somebody to, to put it all together, it would be fun to go down and see some of this stuff. I know you couldn't, you can't do it all in a day. But right. some of I, generally, I generally do a Bordentown trip, a Mercer County trip, and a Monmouth County trip. Okay. It's just that it's it's physically impossible to drive across the state. And oh, absolutely, especially with all too much time in a car. Right, right. Um, okay. Well, we had a couple other questions. Um, so a gentleman had said your uh, the Morris Canal was listed on your uh, list of stone sleeper sites. Uh, yeah. Have you done any research on the Morris Canal sleepers? Yes, I've measured the the stone sleepers in probably six, seven, or eight of the inclined planes. Okay. There's 22 inclined planes. The ones that are on the eastern side have pretty much been urbanized and you can't find any stone. You can find very few. And because there's 20, it takes me four or five days to, to do one inclined plane because I have to uncover the stones, sleep them off, sweep them off, and then I, I let rainfall get on them because when they're just covered with mud, they're covered with mud and you can't see what you're looking at. But in kind plane, nine west and 10 west I've done. Um, I've seen stone sleepers for four others and some of them are on private property. Um, there's a whole story that goes with that and I could talk for another hour, so I'm not going to do that. Well, but, that, but that's a good question. Like Plane 2 East is uh, is very uncovered. and um, That's uh, correct. That's in Roxbury or something? Yeah, Lakewood is the town, but yeah. um, what what, do, what is the makeup of those? Are they local stone also? <laughs> well, you, the answer is there's as, as with all of them, it's partially, if you look to the north side of that, of two east, there is a quarry and, and many, many of the stones, especially the lesser well-shaped stones came directly from that quarry. But when you get to the top of the quarry, if my memory serves me well, you'll see a lot of granites that are coming from a quarry that are, that's probably 10 or 12 miles away. And you'll also find some stones that are stocked in sandstone. And so they're, or, or Passaic sandstones, and they're coming from 10 or 20 miles to the east. So wow. th there was different generations of rebuilding of those, um, those sleepers. And you can, I, I can speak well of nine west and 10 west because I did a great deal of study on those. Those are my first two. And there's three or four generation of spike holes on them. So you have to pay it. So I have to pay attention to those various things too. Yeah, I know at two East, the high ledge iron mine was nearby. And it looks to me that some of them were, were chipped away from that mine as, you know, as they, yeah. but, but anyway, let's. Um. Two last questions. Um, what was the name of the railroad on your map uh, that was in Kentucky? Uh, Louisville and something or other. Let me let me go back. Um, Lexington or Frankfurt, Lexington. Frankfurt, and Lexington. Yes. Okay. Um, last question: Is Joseph Bonaparte related to Napoleon? Excuse me, I couldn't hear of Papi. Is Joseph Bonaparte related to Napoleon? Well, hell, is his brother. <laughs> yeah. He's oh. the king of Spain and the king of something out. So, yeah, that's his brother. That explains the wealth. <laughs> 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 I didn't, you know, it's funny. I, I didn't think that I, I knew, I recognized the name, but didn't think they were related. But son of a gun, the brothers. Yeah. 
Wow. All right. Well, that's the uh, that's the end of the questions. Good enough. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak before your group. I do appreciate it. Well, Pierre, that was that was excellent and very informative. Um, yeah. th terrific. Yeah, we greatly appreciate it, Pierre, and uh, the show will be posted online uh, soon. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, good night, everybody. Um, we'll see everyone the second Thursday in February for uh, Steve Barry's show. Uh, so good night, everyone. Good night.